Let's say you were bored and you cut two rectangular holes or slits in a cardboard box. If you were to shine a flashlight through the two slits, what do you think you would see on the wall behind the box? Most people would just say you'd see two rectangular bright spots on the wall. And most people would be right, that's exactly what you see. But now let's say you make two slits that are really close together. This piece of plastic has two thin slits cut into it. In fact, they're so close together they look just like a single line, but there's actually two slits here separated by an extremely small distance. Now, if we shine a laser through these really thin slits, what would we see on the wall behind it? Most people would just say you'd see two really thin slits of light, but most people would be wrong in this case. You actually see this. Why are there so many bright spots here? And why don't you just see two thin slivers of light behind the two thin slits? We see more than two bright spots because light doesn't just travel in straight lines after it passes through a hole. Light will actually spread out when it encounters a hole. This spreading out is called diffraction. In this drawing, you can imagine that every line represents the crest or peak of the wave. And you can imagine that midway points between lines represent the trough or valleys of the wave. So far, this diagram just shows the wave emanating from the top hole. But waves are going to emanate from the bottom hole as well. When the waves from the two holes overlap, it'll cause wave interference. If I draw a dot everywhere a blue line intersects a green line, I would be marking points of constructive interference, since these are points where the two wave crests line up perfectly. Along these lines, the light would be strong, and any point that they are directed towards on the wall would be bright. Similarly, if I draw a dot everywhere a blue line lies exactly in the middle of two green lines, I'd be marking points of destructive interference, since these are points where the crest of one wave lines up with the trough of the other wave, causing destructive interference. Along these lines, the light waves would cancel each other, and any part of the wall that they're directed towards would be dark. So this is why we saw an alternating pattern of bright and dark spots on the wall. The bright spots are where the waves are constructively interfering, and the dark spots are where the waves are destructively interfering. You'll always see a bright constructive point along the line in the middle of the two slits. The waves from each hole have to travel a certain distance to make it to that point. The path length difference, delta x, is defined to be the difference between how far the wave from one hole has to travel to get to that point on the wall, as compared to how far the wave from the other hole has to travel to get to that same point on the wall. Both waves travel the same distance to the midway point, so the path length difference to the center point is zero. Since the path length difference is zero, we call this center bright spot the n equals zero constructive point, or the n equals zero maximum. For the next bright spot, the waves don't travel the same distance to that point on the wall. The wave from the bottom slit has to travel one wavelength farther than the wave from the top slit. So the path length difference is equal to one wavelength. Since the path length difference is equal to one wavelength, we call this bright spot the n equals one constructive point, or you'll hear it referred to as the first order maximum. Similarly, for the next bright spot, the wave from the bottom slit has to travel two wavelengths farther than the wave from the top slit. So we call this the n equals two constructive point, or the second order maximum. For the bright spot below the central maximum, the wave from the bottom slit has to travel one wavelength less than the wave from the top slit, so we call this point the n equals negative one maximum. For the dark spot above the central maximum, the path length difference is equal to a half wavelength, so this is the n equals one half destructive point, or the n equals one half minimum. For the next dark spot above that, the path length difference is equal to three halves of a wavelength, so we call this the n equals three halves minimum. And for the dark spot underneath the central maximum, the path length difference is negative one half of a wavelength, so we call this the negative one half minimum. The bright constructive points all satisfy the condition that the path length difference is equal to n times lambda, where n is an integer like 0, 1, 2, or even negative 1, negative 2, and so on. The dark destructive points also satisfy the condition that the path length difference is equal to n times lambda, but n has to be a half integer like 1 half, 3 halves, 
negative one half, and so on. Now something that would really make our lives easier in tackling these problems is to develop a relationship between the path length difference and the angle from the central line. This would allow us to quickly determine which angles give constructive interference and which angles give destructive interference. To find this expression, let's call the distance between the two slits D. Now, every point on the wall is at a different angle from the central line. We know the waves will have to travel different distances to that point. The question is, how is the path length difference related to that angle? Let's zoom in on this section here to find out. The waves travel out of these two holes. We can draw a line from the first hole that intersects the second line at a right angle. We do this because after these two points, the waves travel the same distance to the point on the wall. That means the leftover piece on the bottom line is the extra distance that the bottom wave had to travel. Or in other words, this is the path length difference, delta x. If you use some trigonometry and assume that the distance from the slits to the wall is large, you can prove to yourself that the upper angle in this right triangle is going to be the same as the angle from the central line to that point on the wall. Since we have a right angle now, we can say that sine theta is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Delta x, the path length difference, is the opposite side, and d is the hypotenuse. Rearranging, we get that the path length difference delta x is equal to d times sine theta. This is the relationship that we were looking for between delta x and the angle theta. From now on, we just know that for any point on the wall at an angle theta, the path length difference is going to be equal to d, the slit spacing, times sine of that theta. Now, remember that constructive points on the wall satisfied the condition that the path length difference equaled integer number of wavelengths. Since we know that the path length difference delta x is equal to d sine theta, this means that d sine theta has to equal integer number of wavelengths for constructive points. d sine theta equals n lambda is the most well-known double slit equation there is. This equation will tell you what angles required to get to the n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 maximums or constructive points. In fact, it'll even give you the angles to the destructive points. You just have to plug in n as a half integer, like a half, three halves, five halves, negative a half, and so on. Remember that lambda is talking about the wavelength and d is talking about the slit spacing. Also, for some problems, you might have to relate the distance between the double slit and the wall, l, to the vertical distance from the center line to a point on the wall, x. They're related because tangent of theta is just equal to opposite over adjacent. X is the opposite and L is the adjacent for this right triangle. So this should be everything you need to solve double slip problems.